One day about 15 years ago or so, my Aunt Anna Mae rung me up. She had found a copy of my book, Headquarters, I don't know how, and she read the whole thing. She called me up and said, I have one question after finishing your book. And I thought, after hundreds of pages, you've only got one question. Well, I think I can handle that. Hit me with it. She said, Mike, what is indie wrestling? I'm Mike Quackenbush. This is Till We Make It End. If you are passionate about the craft of professional wrestling and you are never done learning about it, then make sure you subscribe to my channel now so that you never miss out. And along the way, don't forget to do all the YouTubing things like the liking and the commenting and the blah blah blahing. You know what I'm talking about. So here's the thing about trying to answer the question, what is indie wrestling? Because it requires a certain frame of reference about professional wrestling's history that most people simply don't have. I guess when answering that question, it is important to say there's a short answer and there's a long answer. Luckily, I have time enough to go over both. So the short answer to the question, what is indie wrestling, could be this. Independent professional wrestling is made without corporate backing and usually in the absence of much bureaucracy. Resultingly, it is possessed of lower production standards than mainstream wrestling is, and generally speaking, it touts its DIY spirit as a badge of authenticity. Conversely, mainstream professional wrestling does have corporate money funding its endeavors and is typically surrounded by a wealth of bureaucracy. It makes high production standard output, which is most often meant to be consumed as a television program. And in those ways, mainstream professional wrestling and independent professional wrestling are two very distinctly different entities. Oh, there's also the long answer. The long-winded answer to what is indie wrestling could be this. Independent professional wrestling is a response to the death of regionalized or territory era professional wrestling from decades past, and it is a reaction to the glossy, blatantly commercial wrestling output that has dominated the mainstream since the late 1980s. And if hearing just some of that wrestling jargon already seems overwhelming, well, maybe I can supply some vital context by bringing up an analogy that does not hinge on wrestling history. Instead, how about this? Let's talk about a transformative era in music. For this analogy to work, we're gonna have to talk about highly commercial corporate level musical output and the musical genre that was a reaction to that music. In the 1970s, the three genres of music that dominated the American music scene and charts were disco, adult contemporary or mellow rock, and corporate rock. You may know, disco was glossy, overproduced dance music that seemingly had no message. It was rarely political or controversial in content whatsoever, and it is perhaps best exemplified by the Bee Gees song Night Fever, the best-selling record of 1978. Long before the term adult contemporary had lodged itself in the popular lexicon, we use the term mellow rock when referring to the slicker, smoother version of soft pop that had first emerged at the end of the 1960s. By the end of the 1970s, when disco is dominating the charts and the dance floors, mellow rock is becoming a force to be reckoned with. And its chief proponents include the Doobie Brothers from San Jose, California, Jefferson Starship from San Francisco, Fleetwood Mac, which in its most famous incarnation was headquartered in the San Fernando Valley, and the band Toto from Los Angeles. It was largely a regional phenomenon from California that eventually took the mainstream by storm. And it is perhaps best exemplified by the 1979 Doobie Brothers single, 
What a Fool Believes, one of the only non-disco tracks to top the Billboard charts that year. And lastly, there's corporate rock, the somewhat inelegant term that is applied to acts that would go on giant arena tours backed by corporate sponsorships. And you might be able to put acts like Journey, Meatloaf, or Boston into this category. Their middle-brow, working-class appeal allowed them to pack humongous venues and to take advantage of the cross-promotional opportunities therein, like sponsorships from giant soft drink companies. It featured merchandising tie-ins of a scale the music industry had never seen before, and it felt less like music as live artistic experience and more as a commercial opportunity. Corporate rock is perhaps best exemplified by Boston's top five hit, Don't Look Back. In these three musical genres, disco, mellow rock, and corporate rock, we have numerous analogies for the professional wrestling of the 1980s and 90s. This is when the territory system is dying in wrestling. And even the last regional hangers-on, like the AWA up in Minnesota or World Class down in Texas, end up being utterly bulldozed by the glossy and extremely commercial output of the World Wrestling Federation. The WWF, later to be rebranded as WWE, does away with all the tiny regionalized organizations and supplants them with one national level entity. And they don't have the playing field all to themselves for very long, because shortly thereafter, they are joined by Ted Turner's extremely well-financed World Championship Wrestling. Millions and millions of dollars are poured into making this type of mainstream professional wrestling. And this corporate output is increasingly resembling sports entertainment by taking a giant step away from what used to be presented in dimly lit, smoke-filled auditoriums in the 1950s and taking a gigantic step toward glossy and perfectly choreographed television programming with broad mainstream appeal. This period of professional wrestling even comes complete with its own hedonistic subplot that would sometimes rear its head in newspaper articles or television exposés, discussing a lifestyle rife with sex, drugs, and the type of stuff we typically think is the exclusive domain of rock and roll stars and VH1 specials. It was a little bit hedonistic, and in that way, this type of wrestling is also a little bit disco. This version of professional wrestling is also a little bit mellow rock. It is smoother and slicker than any of its forebears, so that it is optimized to appeal to a broad, mainstream audience. In the same way that it is extremely hard to imagine how the Hulk Hogan or the Kurt Hennig that you can see on old AWA videotapes from the early 80s would, by the end of that same decade, transform into the most polished performers on Earth, you can listen to the first nine or ten Fleetwood Mac albums and really struggle to imagine how this band will one day go on to record Tango in the Night or Rumors, which would go on to sell 25 million units. In fairness to the Mac, they did undergo a few key personnel changes in there to arrive at their most famous lineup. And this version of wrestling is also a little bit corporate rock. It's giant arena tours where sometimes the cross-promotional opportunities and merchandising overshadow the wrestling matches themselves. An example from my own life. In the 1990s, I attended a WCW house show with a couple friends of mine from my then day job. And two of these guys ended up missing the first six matches on the card because they were standing in line to buy an NWO t-shirt. So, did they really buy a ticket to watch a wrestling event? Or did they buy a ticket to stand in line for wrestling merchandise? Not unlike corporate rock, this version of professional wrestling could feel crassly commercial. Mainstream wrestling offerings from the 80s and 90s have a lot in common with the late 70s musical genres disco, mellow rock, and corporate rock. And what is the response to these three genres dominating the airwaves and the shelf spaces at music stores? Well, the answer is punk. And in punk, we have the perfect analogy for indie wrestling. Just like indie wrestling, punk 
is a response to the perceived inauthenticity of overproduced, exceptionally commercial musical output. Now, is there something wrong with the music of Journey, or the Bee Gees, or Fleetwood Mac? No. I can think of songs by all three of those bands that I like quite a bit. In fact, if one of them came on the radio right now, I wouldn't switch the station. Unless it's Tusk. I would change the station if it's Tusk. Unlike disco, punk was quick to embrace controversy. It was never glossy nor overproduced. It was loud, dirty, and raw. And if you could dance to it at all, you certainly weren't dancing the hustle. Unlike adult contemporary or mellow rock, there was nothing broad about punk. It was neither slick nor smooth. In fact, it was rough around the edges, and its DIY spirit was used to signal its authenticity to its audience. Unlike their corporate rock counterparts, punk bands of the day did not pack Madison Square Garden the way the band Boston did in 1977. No. If you wanted to hear the Ramones play, well, you went to Manhattan's East Village to a tiny club called CBGB. That's where the Cramps played, where the Patti Smith group played. That's where the Misfits played. There was nothing middle of the road about this wave of punk bands who were proudly political, frequently abrasive, and decidedly non-commercial. And consciously or not, they were a reaction to the dominant trends of the day. Genres like disco, mellow rock, and corporate rock. Similarly, indie wrestling is neither glossy nor overproduced. It has fewer dollars behind it and thus lower production values. It is more rough and ramshackle than it is slick or smooth. The do-it-yourself aesthetic of independent professional wrestling is most often colored by the vision of one single person. It is not informed by the priorities of an executive committee, nor is it tailored to corporate sponsors. Real indie wrestling is a little bit rough around the edges. It is underfunded and typically relegated to smaller venues. The true mecca of independent professional wrestling back in the 90s was Viking Hall. And on most nights, it didn't feature wrestling. It was a bingo hall. For my money, independent professional wrestling as a concept wholly separate from the territory system and from mainstream wrestling only really emerges when extreme championship wrestling takes the stage in August of 1994. And just as the Ramones were to CBGB, so was ECW to the Viking Hall. So much so that on a worldwide basis, that building is still referred to as the ECW Arena. Just like the inevitable schism in punk, which then led to various subgenres like hardcore punk, new wave, and a variety of other flavors, independent professional wrestling is rich in subgenres as well. And each time one of these new subgenres is formed and birthed into the world, it is in some way, shape, or form a reaction to the well-financed corporate output of mainstream professional wrestling companies. How well-financed? Well, the World Wrestling Federation became World Wrestling Entertainment, and it is now traded on the New York Stock Exchange, holding about a billion dollars in assets. New Japan Pro Wrestling is owned by Bushi Road, a publicly traded company on the Tokyo Stock Exchange holding about 18 billion yen in assets. Those are heavy hitters. World Wrestling Entertainment and New Japan Pro Wrestling, they play giant arenas. They enjoy great commercial success. Their popularity and mainstream appeal is beyond reproach, and they have a track record decades long to offer as proof. Is there something wrong with liking what the WWE or New Japan Pro Wrestling makes? No. I can think of events put on by both that I like quite a bit. If WrestleMania 8 or the Super J Cup 94 were on right now, I wouldn't change the channel. Nobody gets to tell us what to like. Sometimes, we want to listen to Night Fever by the Bee Gees or What a Fool Believes by the Doobie Brothers. But if you're like me, that's not 
all you want to listen to. Restricting your wrestling diet to only the glossy corporate offerings is a little like deciding you will only listen to disco for the rest of your life. If all you watch is WWE, you like disco. That is the main takeaway of today's video. True independent wrestling, which arrives on the scene in the 1990s as a jagged and rowdy alternative to the overproduced sports entertainment of the day, must always exist somewhere outside the mainstream. What is indie wrestling? Well, it's pro wrestling that's made on a shoestring budget, presented in underwhelming venues, delivered to an audience that craves something exotic in its diet, and it is always a reaction of some kind to what the giant companies are manufacturing and shipping as professional wrestling. It rarely has mass appeal. It never has corporate backing. And you will feel its DIY spirit alive in every detail. Long answer.